It is another edition of the On The Mic podcast, and uh, UFC pay-per-view uh, shows are back. This time, no Kelly Murphy, and got to watch what I, I, I say here. I want to say I got the more attractive guest this time, but I don't know how people are going to take that. Definitely the more handsome. Definitely more handsome. But uh, he's one of the busiest and hardest working men in the business. I don't even know where to start with this man. Uh, he's a near, dear friend of mine, and that, that right there is an honor. Coach. And uh, man, media guru, everything. Dean Thomas, sir, how are you? I'm good, man, and I appreciate that uh, nice, warm welcome. And uh, yeah, I'm just listen. I just, I'm just a dude that don't want to work a real job. So <laughs> anytime somebody will hire me to do anything else, I'm good. I'm in it. <laughs> I mean, you're on Sirius XM. You do great work on the like UFC pre uh, pay per view shows, the weigh in shows. Um, we're not going to talk about how you guys called me out last year, but uh, you know the ESPN <laughs> analyst shows. You're on Sirius XM channel 156. You're at CFFC. I mean, you're just doing so much. I, I know you you say you just don't want a real job, but you know there's so many different things, and I don't know if people realize this, right? Like it's a different role to sit down and do a radio show for two three hours than it is to be on a desk for a TV show. And, and so I, I guess my biggest question for you is, how do you balance all of that? Uh, well, you just got to learn the roles. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it really is like, and that's, and I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think people understand that and realize that those are all different roles that you have to play. Almost like playing, um, you know, playing a football game, you know, like a quarterback does something different from the, receiver but you have a job to do and you just got to learn the best way to play the role to your skill sets so um so that's really what it is is that you know not just having information but knowing how to manifest it and and massage that the way it needs to be in in the different roles so it's very it's, it can be tricky at times but you know worse come to worse man it's just you know just shut up and pretend like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely know what you're talking about. Yeah. Just for everyone who's listening or watching, you know, like it, it's very simple to put it in, in difficulty terms, right? Like in TV, you probably have 30 seconds to two minutes, depending on what the topic is that you get in and get out. When you're on Sirius XM on channel 156, and it's just you and, uh, uh, you know, another co-host or host of yours, uh, RJ Clifford, when you guys are running a show together, that's, 15, 20 minute segments, and you guys are bouncing back and forth the entire time. No one's just saying one thing and there's no commercial breaks and all that. So just that alone, I'm going to throw a bonus question in here about this. What is your, what, what role do you like the most? Is it the analyst that I know you say you love them all, but which do you actually really like feel you thrive in the best radio TV announcing? What is it? Man, that's so that's man. I don't know which one I thrive in the best. I guess that's up to interpretation of like, who's, how you judge it um but i think my favorite role of all of it is doing the desk for the uh fight nights because that's honestly of all the things that i do that's the most challenging one it really is it's it's the most challenging so i feel extra challenged doing that uh like right now i'm working the desk for uh the pay-per-view and while that's got its own challenges it's not as challenging as doing it for fight night. Right. So it's just, again, it's, it's very different, but, um, but it, it's still pretty difficult, man. Like it's, you know, like being, <laughs> being focused, like you don't realize that you're on TV the entire time. And that's one of the challenges for me because like doing radio, like when I'm doing radio, I'm used to just like, <laughs> you know, and, but when you're on TV the entire time, you're hot the whole time. They're always watching. So you got to really be engaged and focused the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess what, one thing I've always been curious about, because I, I will admit, I, I, you know, no one likes to show off, but every time I'm, I'm out and, and whether it's a fight night or whenever you get brought in on a broadcast, if I'm out and about, I'm like, that's the first man to ever train me. Whatever he's saying right now is right. <laughs> Listen to him, turn the volume up. I'm yelling at the bar and stuff, but when you, when you get brought in live, when or, you know, they're talking about corner advice that we heard or whatever's happening in a fight, would you say that that's like, I would feel that's the most difficult challenge because I think some people think on, the, on one side, yes, you're in a studio and you're just waiting until they come back to the studio. But when you get brought in like that, 
you have to be watching the entire fight, listening to the entire corners during, uh, you know, the breaks of the rounds. Like, how hard is that when they're bringing you in live? That's actually not. That's actually not that difficult. It's not that bad. Like the hardest part. There's two things that are challenging about that. Like when I'm working with like Paul Felder and Dominic Cruz. I mean, those guys pretty much see everything, you know. So you know, having a different opinion than those guys, because I mean, and they're constantly talking. So to be able to come up with something different from them can be challenging at times. But the hardest part about that for me is that my mic is not live until they turn it on. And I'm not talking until, so when I start talking, I can't hear myself sometimes. So I don't even, I don't know how loud I'm coming in, how soft I'm coming in. So it could be very, so for me, it's difficult just initiating the conversation and then saying what I want to say in like 20 seconds and then being done with it. But like coming in, it'd be hard. So sometimes like if you hear me struggle, it's because I can't hear myself. And when we're in the arena where it's loud, I'm like, I'm, I feel like I'm yelling at times and I may not be, or maybe, but I just, I just can't hear myself. I, I know on pay-per-views, it's usually a little louder and I, and I imagine why. Um, but yeah. with, with that said, um, I don't listen. Dana White gets enough credit for everything he does already. He's got plenty of fans. He's got plenty of haters. But we were talking off air before we started this. Like you and I have history. Like we were doing this podcast and we were just friends before you took on all these jobs. And I want to give Dana any more credit than he already gets. But do you think your time on looking for a fight and being around that, do you think that helps skyrocket you? Or I Oh, mean, yeah. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, that was really kind of the you know, that was really getting my foot in the door. You know what I'm saying? Like I got my foot in the door from doing that. And that gave me the opportunity to be seen and to be heard. Like I never, I didn't wake up one day and be like, you know what? I want to commentate. I didn't even, I never wanted to commentate. In fact, I remember seeing like when Tyron used to do it, I'll be like, man, I don't know if I'd ever want to do that. Like that was my thought towards it. But when the opportunity came, when it was real to me, where they were like, hey, you ever thought about doing it? I was like, shit, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to work a real job. So <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll try it. And then I did it. And I was like, man, this is a lot of fun. You know, this is a really cool gig. And then, you know, more gigs came and more gigs came and more gigs came. And next thing I know, I was, you know, working every weekend pretty, pretty much. <laughs> Don't want a real job, but you got to give up the weekends. And, you know, I'll say this. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I credit, give up my weekends. A credit to you, you know, and, and I think I've said it on here and to you and, and off air. I, uh, I'm i a big regular sports fan outside of UFC. And, you know, I always look at the NFL. And as someone who came up wanting to cover the NFL, I got bitter in my early 20s. Like, they'll never take someone like me to break down X's and O's. They just keep hiring former players and all that. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that there's a place in this world for the, the former fighter, the former football player, the former professional. And, and their input means so much more than a nerd like myself who just sits at a TV all day and just tries to break things down and looks at a computer and tries to really you know break down the sport, whatever the sport may be. So really, I, I compliment you because... Yes, we've got the Paul Felders. We've got those guys that are, you know, Dominic Cruz is Daniel Cormier who call the action. But I do think it's such a different curve to actually break it down from an analyst standpoint when you're not calling the fight and you're just kind of brought in or if you're on a studio show. And, and there's a lot of guys like that, especially I look at NFL Network and I just kind of compare the two. And I think you're, you're really one of the best fits for the job possible. And uh, you've been killing it. So I just want to commend you on that. Man, thank you very much, man. I mean, it's, I wish, you know, like I said, I wish it was something I could be like, yeah, man, I worked hard for this, but it was, I did indirectly, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, my experience going back all the way to 1995 of fighting and learning how to do this and teaching and studying and, you know, getting my ass beat, you know, like all those things really are a part of what I'm doing now, just the experience. So like, it really does um, mean a lot to to hear that it, it paid off in some way because you know I, I didn't I never thought that stuff would pay off. You well, know, just, it definitely like, has. <laughs> yeah, it definitely it's never has. paying off. Uh, I will call you. Out. I think it's very ironic that after I left SiriusXM, then you joined, 
So I don't know if it's a avoid Mike at all costs type thing, but no, you've been killing it. And uh, I see everything that you're doing. And, and here we are just days away from uh, UFC 275. I know there's a complete card, but really when you get down to the bread and butter of this card, there's three fights. There's a Wiley, Joanna, uh, Jade check rematch, which I still believe should have been five rounds. I mean, what now with this media platform, you should be able to call Dana like you have pool, right? Like we all wanted that. You should be like Dana. Everyone's calling in a Sirius XM channel 156 fight nation. They want Joanna and Wiley. They want that five rounds. He should just listen to you. You know, I mean, I don't know if they wanted it five rounds. You know what I'm saying? They may not have wanted it five rounds. I mean, I think Joanna would have wanted it five rounds, but maybe Wei Lee didn't want five rounds. And, you know, and, and fighting five rounds also comes at a cost. And that cost costs the company to go, oh, now you're fighting another five rounds, so we got to pay you more money? No, we'll just make it three. And I'm sure, but honestly, five rounds favors Joanna. And while she, I don't know if she wanted it or not, but it doesn't favor Wei Li. And if Wei Li was like, I don't want five rounds, I could see why, because it doesn't favor her in this fight. Well, I think one thing that favors both of them is what we heard this week. Dana White said this is a title eliminator. Uh, you know, both women have held the belt. Joanna obviously really reigned supreme over this division at 115 for so long. What what does that do, especially Joanna being out for so long? If you can speak to that, like they both have championship hunger inside of them. They both want to get back on their throne. But being away for as long as she was, being Joanna and Jacek, not, and I know you said five rounds favors her, but sometimes we see, you know, both extremes, right? A fighter could be off for so long, come back, and, and it's like they're incredible in their comeback, or cage rust is a real thing, and, or they're just lack of focus, or their hunger isn't there anymore. How do you feel this, you know, th this title eliminator label being put on this can help Joanna after being away for so long? I mean, it's going to have to because she's going to have to. And I know she does. You know, I don't think she, there's going to be any issue with motivation for her because she wouldn't have took this fight in the first place. I mean, we know that she wasn't just willing to take any old fight. Like, she wasn't going to go and fight anybody. I mean, it had to be a big, important fight or a title shot, but this is a big, important fight. One, that she gets to redeem herself. And two, if she wins it, she knows she's going to fight in the title. And who's holding the belt? Carla Esparza which is not as scary as Rose Namajunas. So for Joanna, I mean, even if she, there was a moment where she's like, man, I don't know why I came back. She can always look at, man, I can get the title back. Like, really, if I beat this girl, I will get the title back. Because in my opinion, she's a better fighter than Carla Esparza. I think everyone knows this. She beat Carla. I mean, she beat her half to death. So her motivation really should be, I need to get this title back and then I can ride out and be and be done with it. Because if she does get this title back, you have to then say she might be the best straw weight ever. I know she has the two losses to Rose, but then she will have two wins over Carla Esparza, who has two wins over Rose. So I mean the math works math. out. Yeah, you know, I mean, the math, math will work out. And if she and if she can get the belt back and then ride off into the sunset. I mean, she's already a Hall of Famer, but I think that she wants to go out on top. But this is a and this is the only opportunity. I don't want to say the only opportunity, but this is her best opportunity to go out on top, and that's to beat Wei Li John, fight Carla, get the belt back, and ride out. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. But it's like you really know what you're doing in this media world because that was going to be my next question of. Carla holding the belt does that does that motivate Joanna even more I think it motivates both women no disrespect to Carla Esparza but I'm, I'm going to go with two extremes here one's going to be the most recent title fight we had and then I'm going to talk about the original fight uh, of this rematch in which it was made for our, uh the, the first one being the strawway fight between Carla and Rose and I know I, I never want to be disrespectful to fighters but at the end of the day you got to call it what it is was that title fight between Carla and Rose the worst title fight you've seen <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, I'm at the point now that I don't watch fights to be entertained anyway. Right. So to me, I don't look at that fight and go, oh, man, it's the worst fight ever. Oh, I'm not entertained. I saw it as underwhelming and two fighters that didn't. I saw one fighter 
that was doing was happy with what she was doing and that was rose just she was happy to not get taken down and happy to you know to be defending well and then i saw another fighter who was incapable of doing more and that was the difference is that rose could have did more she just didn't want to because she was just happy with what she was doing carla i don't think could have did anything different which is why i still think rose is the better fighter she just didn't it's a weird thing. She's the better fighter, but it's 0 and 2 against this girl. Weird, but it's just the sample size is so small. But I'm sure if they fought 100 times, Rose would win 98 of those times. Right. So, but this just happened to be the two in the first two times that they fought. But um, I don't, I, I mean, I don't, in terms of entertainment value, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, Joanna and Whaley, but. It was a very underwhelming performance from both of them that um that really kind of didn't do their best. You know, I don't think that they did. I don't think they fought their best. Well, I know Rose didn't fight her best. I don't think that Carla could have fought any better. I mean, perfectly said, honestly, with that said, outside of talking about it from an entertainment standpoint, I think we can all agree Whaley and Joanna won was one of the most obviously entertaining fights, but one of the greatest performances from two females we could ever see or two fighters in general, uh, as far as in terms of just how significant that fight was. And, and, I, and I will kind of tear it down a little bit to just say from a woman's standpoint, because I do think, you know, that could have inspired the next generation, not even the eight and nine year olds. I'm talking about the younger fighters, the Aaron Blanchfields of the world. Some of these younger fighters, they see a war like Joanna and Wei Lee from a few years ago. And it shows them what it takes to be championship caliber. Do you think that fight, obviously it's a future Hall of Fame fight, in my opinion. Uh, do you think that fight really helped open doors and open eyes to not only straw weights, but to women fighters as a whole? I mean, that's a bold statement to say that it opened eyes and opened doors. I think that, you know, it's a, it's been a slow process of, of women's fighting being more accepted and more appreciated. And for me, I kind of take it a little bit personally. I was talking to a, a, a woman today and I was like, yeah, I'm such a feminist because because she was telling me how in women's lacrosse, they play by different rules than men do. Like they don't, they're not allowed to have contact. They can't hit. And I'm like, what in the world? Like, so they, they have to like dumb themselves down. They can't play the same rules. When you look at women's boxing, they have to box two minute rounds as opposed to men boxing three. And then now, you know, when you have Whaley John and Joanna, I mean, they set the bar so high in terms of going after it in a fight. And, but I don't necessarily think that when people saw that fight, they were going, oh, look what women can do. They just said it was a badass fight. And, but, but no one really looked at that as like, look what women can do, which we probably should more and be like, man, listen, we got to give them more opportunities. But you got to give the UFC credit. If there's any sports organization that gives women opportunity, it's the UFC. Because if you look at the last few cards, I mean, these last couple of years, rather, like women have been headlining main events. They've been really, the UFC has done such a good job of really trying to put them on a level, a level playing field with men. And I'm not just saying that because I, you know, work for the UFC, but like I think MMA in general. I mean, even the PFL did it is doing it with, you know, Kayla Harrison, but you know, and even Bellator with Cyborg giving her her props. But at the end of the day, you know, I think that we just need to really recognize the importance and the power that women do have, and the fact, like I said, women's boxing they box for two minute rounds, and I'm like. How and how how do we how it's 2022? How are we still getting away with that? But I don't know. But to say I don't know if that really opened the eyes up for women, but I mean I think it opened the eyes up for just MMA in general. But um hopefully some young girls saw that and were were inspired. Absolutely. It's hard not to be, and no matter male or female, um, you know, you watch that fight, it's hard not to be a fan. That's one that creates fans in, in for, forever and potential fighters in the future. Uh, with that being said, we got two, two more fights on this card I want to talk to you about. And uh, kind of going in what we're talking about, 
uh, Valentina Shevchenko. And to go back to your, your most recent point, you know, with women not only headlining, you know the guy very well. How many times has Dana White publicly said, like when Amanda Nunes was a, a two-division champ with Valentina Shevchenko, when Joanna was running, they can do whatever they want. I don't care. They're a badass. I'm not telling them Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, he says that. Like, they, and he just recently said that about Valentina. Like, if she yeah. wins this fight, she can do whatever she wants. <laughs> and so she'll take on Talia Santos. And and it, and I hate to say this, right? Because as I continue to say, and I always say on here, especially preview shows, I never want to be disrespectful to another fighter. But when the boss and when like the the big talking heads and those who know this sport best, like yourself, Dean Thomas, when we talk about fighters like Valentina Shevchenko. The proof is in the pudding. They are levels and levels above all the competition they face so far. How can we look at this fight objectively and really think there's a path for Talia Santos? Because it is a fight. Anything can happen. Yeah, anything can happen. Um, but to it's not being disrespectful to say that Talia said Santos is at a disadvantage in this fight. I mean, it's it's more of a testament of how good Valentina is and how consistent she is in being good. You know, when you when you're dealing with some champions, you know, sometimes they slip and they make mistakes, and you know, you catch them out partying. But Valentina is the type of champion that you, you don't hear a lot about her outside of fighting. You know, she's very dedicated and serious towards her craft. So she's going to be always consistent and always reliable to win. And she's doing it in a fashion where it just looks easy. So it's not disrespectful to Talia Santos. Um, with that being said, Talia Santos has a very uphill battle in this fight. I mean, she's fighting a girl who, if you study, you see she doesn't make a lot of mistakes. And that can be very intimidating. If you don't study you're doing yourself a disservice because you're not going to be prepared for what she's about to bring. And that is a lot. And Taya Santos has her, has her homework to do. I don't know if it's going to be enough, but what I will, what I will say is that Taya Santos might be stronger than Valentina. That's the advantage that she has. She might be stronger, you know, in a clinch situation. I don't know whose technique is better, but in a clinch situation, Talia Santos might be stronger. She might be the strongest girl in that division, maybe even the strongest girl pound for pound. So if she can be able to capitalize off that in some way and turn that into a W, then she well, needs to be, well, she needs to make that, she got to make that happen. But that's a very, it's, it's a very tall order. Two, just two questions on that, then I'll move to the main event. How much of this is mental for Santos? Because it's going to be, how, how much of this is mental for Santos? Because we've seen this, right, where champions are built up, they're hyped up. I mean, we don't have to talk about UFC 193 to talk about Ronda and Holly, and the only person who believed in Holly Holm was Holly Holm in her corner, you know? So when, when you have this label of levels and levels above that Valentina Shevchenko has received, rightfully so, how much is for the opponent, is it a mental game of not falling into, oh, my God, I'm facing Valentina Shevchenko? A lot of it is, and that's the problem with, with this and and could be the problem with Talia Santos and 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 I think could be her downfall. I mean, when she first got to the UFC, she lost to Mara Romello. And why did she lose? Because she was distracted by the lights. She admitted to say, yeah, I was, you know, I got nervous. Uh, the nerves got to me, you know, fighting the UFC the first time. And this is a much, and this is a much bigger fight. <laughs> you know, it's a completely different country, completely different time zone. But there are ways to deal with that. I mean, hopefully she's gotten some sort of um, maybe she's gotten a, a sports psychologist to help her deal with that and to help her realize her purpose. And there are some advantages to being to to leaving and fighting in a different country, because then you can separate that from your own reality and, and be able to use that and freak that into your new reality and be able to perform in a new reality. Um, but. With that said, again, like you, it's very difficult to fight the best in the world when you're not completely confident. Like if she's if she has an ounce of doubt, she can't win this fight. If, if Valentina Shevchenko is the last one, and I'll move to the main event, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, if Valentina Shevchenko does successfully defend this title, 
What does she do next? I know Dana said he's open to, a, you know, her chasing the second belt. Would you like to see that? Would you like to see her stay at 25? What do you think she should do? No, nah, she has to go up. You know, I, I thought about this earlier today, and there's really nothing left for her to do at 125. And, you know, the, the challenges at 125 for her are very slim, and they're not going to get much better soon because the girls that are that have the potential to to match her won't have enough time to develop in the time that they need. So they're going to, they're trying to rush them. I mean, when you look at like uh, Manon Fior, like they're rushing her a little bit because like, there's just no one else. And they're at least trying to get these girls out there. Now I could imagine I'm doing that same thing to Aaron Blanchfield. They're like, okay, you beat, you know, uh, Miranda Maverick and JJ Aldrich. Guess what? You know, so time to move up. So, because we need somebody for Valentina. But if Valentina goes up to 135, that also gives these girls a little bit more time to get some experience and to, and to grow a little bit. And that's what the division needs right now. Is they, the girls need a little bit more time to grow and develop and get a little bit better. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. All right, main event time. I guess the simple question is, I don't. besides Tom Brady, who's like the exception to every rule ever, um, is there a, another sport where – fighters can thrive or like where athletes can thrive, like fighting. Like I just, I, I, I Glover to Shara winning the belt after so long, after such a storied career. And then they line them up with the top contender, Yuri Prochaska. I mean, great story Glover to Shara, but Dean, do you think it ends <laughs> this weekend? You know, up until two days ago, I thought that this was going to be a nightmare fight for Glover. And then I really started sitting down and watching them and looking at these fights looking at their previous fights. And I said, man, I'm picking Glover in two. <laughs> in two? In two. I just think that Glover's a, a much smarter fighter than those other guys that, that Yuri has faced. And I think that what Yuri does well, Glover won't fall into that. He shouldn't fall into that. And what Yuri does, doesn't do so well is what Glover does well, right? So, like, I think, you know, styles make fights, and I think this is kind of a bad stylistic matchup for Yuri. But the one thing that Yuri does have is that the youth, like, you can't deny that. And I don't think it's much so much as his youth as it could be just Glover's age, and sometimes it just catches up. So not that, you know, Yuri's young, but that Glover's old, and it could catch up. But if it doesn't catch up by Saturday night, Glover should win this fight. I, I like I like that prediction. I did not see that coming. I know Yuri's like, you know, the, the new kid on the block and everybody, the fancy new car, everybody's going for it. It's loud. It's exciting. It looks different, right? Because he's got the whole – what would you say he does with his hair? What would you call that? That's like a, um, a samurai man bun. <laughs> and he fights like a samurai. Like, you know, I think – People sometimes like will get caught up in those highlights, right? The Dominic Reyes one probably being the most prolific on his highlight reel. He's got tons of them, but especially in his time in the UFC, like we will see that Dominic Reyes knockout all weekend leading up to that fight up until they step inside the cage. Um, when you have an older veteran like Glover, though, and you're, and you're facing a Yuri, what do you think the biggest thing for Glover, whether it's style or mental or whatever it may be, what do you think the biggest thing Glover needs to focus on in this fight? Well, he obviously can't get caught in a, in like a back and forth striking battle and, and allow Yuri to get going and start moving forward. Yuri does his best work when he's moving forward and like overwhelming guys with punches. And he has the ability to overwhelm guys with punches because he's got He's got longer arms than most guys, and he punches from wild angles. And he, he can get away with that sometimes, because, again, because of his long arms. But his defense suffers from it, and we've seen guys clip him and hurt him, but he's still been able to come back. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't think Glover is going to fall into that. Like, we know what Glover is trying to do. Glover is trying to take him down. He knows that, too. That's the problem. But is he able to catch up? But I don't think you can catch up that fast. I don't think he can learn because he said it in an interview, which is could be his downfall. He said, yeah, I've been wrestling. I can wrestle with him now. I've figured out how to wrestle for, you know, MMA and make it work for my style. I'm like, I don't know if you can catch up that fast, you know, with a guy like Glover, who's like 
really good at that. Like, you just can't catch up that fast. Like, you may be able to do it for a little bit. Like, when you look at – when Conor fought – Conor McGregor fought Habib, Conor was very well trained. In that first round, he did everything right to not get taken down. He was very well trained technically. But what happened after that first round? You just couldn't keep up. Like you just, you just can't keep up. Like you can be trained enough, but when you're dealing with a specialist, you just can't keep up because they're just going to throw so much at you at a speed in which you can't keep up with. And I think that's very similar to what can happen in this fight. Now, what does it mean for the division? I mean, obviously, John Jones held supreme over that that division for so long. And then what a story, right? We got Jan Blahovich and now Glover to share. First and foremost. As a veteran of this sport who's been taking it all in since the 90s, when you see these guys grabbing titles, what do you think of that? Man, I love it. You know, but unfortunately, again, this is something I thought about today is that, you know, Glover's accomplishment will always be overshadowed by the division that he's done it in. Unfortunately, you know, being 42 years old, that's obviously like something that's going to stand out. But then when you talk, but if you were to just isolate the light heavyweight division and go, okay, who were the best champions at light heavyweight? I mean, you got like. Is it one? <laughs> just one yeah, guy. John Jones, you know, DC, uh, Chuck Liddell. Yeah. Rant. I mean, it's just the list goes on. I mean, that's always been a fan favorite marquee division in terms of champion, in terms of champions. So Glover is always going to be overshadowed by that, but you can't take that away from his accomplishment of doing what he's done at 42. No, you cannot. It's going to be a hell of a main event. Like I was leaning Yuri, but after talking to you, which is why I do these preview shows and I bring on intelligent people like yourself, because I just want to see the, you know, and hear the other uh, side of things. I, you got me way more intrigued now. I, you know, Glover in, in two, my wallet might thank you uh, this weekend. We'll see. We'll see if I uh, go with, Coach Dean Thomas's advice here. Um, Coach, before I let you go, I just get your prediction on all three fights that we just discussed: Joanna Wei Li, Valentina, and Santos, and then obviously you just said possibly Glover and two. What are your uh, actual predictions for this? I got Joanna by decision. I got Valentina by decision, and then I got Glover by submission. Uh, I love it. So if you guys are looking for a parlay out there. There it is, UFC fight fans. <laughs> the Dean Thomas parlay. I don't. I don't have anything better than. That. Listen, that's my parlay. But I wanna. I do have to put a disclaimer on my parlays. I'm always wrong. <laughs> Me too. I am. But, fan- sense, but I might be. I might always be wrong. But what I'm saying makes perfect sense. It does. It does. <laughs> People just don't, the fighters just don't listen to me and do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> they should. Uh, Coach, as I always say, you know, I consider you uh, such a close friend, not only in this business, but in life. And I, and I really couldn't be happier for you and all that you're doing uh, in this sport and in the media world. I'm sure there's plenty of opportunities awaiting you. And I, I can't wait to see you continue on uh, thriving and succeeding. Thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully it's not months and months before we talk again, but uh, keep doing your thing. I'm super happy for you. My man, let's do it. Thank you, man. I appreciate the time, man.